my goodness. Thank you very much, David. Tedious, I don't know about tedious. I hope. I'm hoping this won't be tedious. I know it won't be tedious for me. Hopefully it won't be tedious for any of you. So how many of you are wedding photographers? I, that should be everybody, right? I'm just checking, you know, it's been a long day, lots of presentations, everybody's ready for some coffee. So it's interesting, I, you know, I was thinking about wedding photography in the context of workflow, and I always hear wedding photographers complaining about having to rush through their images, and they, they want a more efficient workflow so that they can actually get organized quickly. Maybe you've experienced anybody, a nagging bride who wants to get their photos as quickly as possible, like, you know, same day service kind of a thing, right? And so you know, we want to try and work faster and faster. And then I found this statistic that I know, thank goodness they said no food or drink in the room because you guys be throwing tomatoes at me. But I think it was 84.8% .8 of weddings fall on Friday, Saturday, or Sunday. Well, that makes sense, weekend weddings, right? But that means you have like all week to go through all the photos, right? Anybody feeling confident about that? Like that's somehow gonna be plenty of time? So my aim tonight is to give you a better sense of what I think of as a more efficient workflow in Lightroom, a way to move somewhat quickly. Obviously, you know, it's this difficult balance. We wanna take our time, as it were, to work with the images, make sure we're giving them their due, that we're not rushing things, but that we're not wasting a lot of time in the process. So I wanna show you some of the ways that I prefer to work as far as efficiently managing images in Lightroom. Now, one of the first things that you have to be aware of in Lightroom is that Lightroom makes use of a catalog. It's essentially a database that keeps track of your images. So every time you import photos into Lightroom, what you're really saying is, hey, Lightroom, can you keep an eye on these pictures for me? The pictures stay wherever you've put them. So for example, on your internal hard drive or on an external hard drive. But the point is that Lightroom uses a central catalog to manage your photos. And one of the questions, one of the challenges that I hear a lot from photographers is how many catalogs do they need? And I tend to be an advocate for having a single catalog, one catalog for everything, so that you don't have to think about, okay, which catalog are my photos in? And every now and then I get a photographer who disagrees with me, believe it or not, and they'll throw out their reason for why they have a different opinion, why they think I'm wrong, and then I'll explain to them that I'm not. And you know, I usually can come up with a reasonably plausible explanation for why you should have one catalog. And most of that comes down to we're using a tool like Lightroom to manage our images. So why do I want to, at the beginning of the process of trying to find a particular picture, why do I want to have to stop and think about which catalog to open? Well, when it comes to wedding photography, there's a little bit stronger argument in favor of having an individual catalog for each wedding, for example, or for each calendar year, or however you can kind of break things up. I'm still not really crazy about that approach because now you're not using a tool to manage everything. In other words, when you're getting ready to look for a particular wedding photo, when you need to reprint some images from a given wedding or what have you, now you have to find the right catalog. And you don't really have a tool for organizing those catalogs. So by and large, I still prefer to have a single catalog for all of my images. There's some little caveats and I'll talk about those throughout the evening tonight as we discuss some of the various nuances of how you might work with your images. One of the things that I really like about Lightroom as a tool for managing my images is that it's not just a tool for managing my images. Lightroom enables me with a single software application to organize, optimize, and share my photos with relative ease. I was talking to somebody just before the presentation about you know, this notion of using Photoshop, for example. I love Photoshop, but the idea of using Bridge to organize my photos, and then Adobe Camera Raw to process my raw captures, and then Photoshop to apply additional adjustments, I'd much rather have a single application work a little bit more efficiently, if at all possible. So I'm gonna work tonight on the assumption that we're working with a single catalog. Of course, there are some good arguments, some good reasons why you might want to have multiple catalogs. We can address that separately. You're more than welcome to tweet me uh, if you've got questions about working with multiple catalogs, and we'll try and address those over the course of the next few days. Uh, but for now, we're going to focus on using a single catalog. And obviously, I've got some images in a catalog here. But we're going to start off at the proverbial beginning as far as bringing images into Lightroom. So let's take a look at the process of importing images into Lightroom. Once again, Lightroom uses that central catalog. So we need to tell Lightroom about all of our photos. If we don't say, hey, Lightroom, I've got some new pictures, Lightroom doesn't know anything about them. So in the library module, I've got our module picker up here at the top right. I'm in the library module now where I can organize my photos. I've got the develop module for optimizing. I've got the book slideshow print and web modules for sharing the images, et cetera. So we're gonna focus on the library module tonight. 
And down at the bottom of the left panel, I've got that import button. So I'll go ahead and click the import button. And I'm going to choose a source. And in this case, of course, I'm uh, faking it just a little bit as far as which particular images or how I'm going to structure my setup here. Uh, but I've got a couple of simulated digital media cards. And we're going to import some new captures. Uh, in this case, images that were captured on two different cameras. And we'll talk about some of the issues of synchronizing. But I often say that it, when it comes to organizing your images, your work actually starts before you even click the shutter. And that is especially true with wedding photography, as far as I'm concerned, and especially if you're working with multiple photographers. How many of you are adventurous enough to shoot all by yourself without a backup photographer? Anybody? No, one or two? <laughs> yeah, we're generally going to want to have at least a couple of photographers that you've got a backup, somebody get other angles, use a different you know, longer lens versus short lens, et cetera. And that introduces some particular challenges, potentially. I'll show you one really cool thing about Lightroom that makes it easy to keep those images organized. But the first thing that you can do is synchronize the time on both of those cameras, or on all of the cameras that are going to get used for that wedding. Plus, it just kind of feels cool, right? It's like you're in some spy movie plot or something. You're getting ready to head out on a mission. You've got to synchronize your watches. And so synchronize those cameras so that they're all at about the same time, so that when we sort by capture time, will actually have all the images sorted in the correct order. That's especially important if you've got like a backup shooter, your second shooter is traveling across time zones to come help you out. Things can get very, very messy very quickly. So I've selected my source, and in this case I'm importing images from a folder on my drive. Normally this of course would be from, for example, a compact flash card plugged into a card reader. And so I've got the images loaded up here, ready to go, but now I need to tell Lightroom how to deal with them. Well, remember, the images are on a card, and I need them on my computer or on my external hard drive or wherever it is that I'm actually storing my photos. And so the option that I'm generally going to use is that copy option up at the top center. Now, in theory, I actually want to move my photos, right? <laughs> yeah, except for the whole paranoia thing. In theory, I want to move my images off my compact flash card onto my hard drive so that I can start using the card again. In reality, I am scared out of my mind that something's going to go haywire in between that whole process. And so I'm going to copy the images from that card onto my hard drive. And in fact, as we'll see in a moment, I'm going to make a backup at the same time. And that way, when I'm finished with my import process, I feel pretty safe, pretty comfortable that I can put that card back in the camera and reformat it if I need to use it again. Of course, in the case of a wedding, would I ever actually reformat a card while I'm shooting? No way. <laughs> No, before the wedding, just head over to B&H Photo, pick up some extra digital media cards, yeah, exactly, pick up some additional cards, so you've got plenty to shoot the whole wedding so you don't have to reformat. But conceptually, I still want that backup, which means at the time, if I'm downloading during the wedding, if I'm giving my cards off to an assistant, for example, to download during the wedding, at any given time, I've got three copies of every photo. That feels pretty good. That feels safe, comfortable. All right, so we're gonna copy those images. We do have the option to copy as DNG. For me personally, while there are benefits to DNG, for example, typically about a 20% reduction in file size, that's nice. I don't need to have an XMP sidecar file. That's kind of cool. All my met metadata can go right inside the DNG file. But I mentioned that I was a little paranoid, right? I'm not gonna delete my raw capture. And in my mind, I don't want yet another file type to deal with. So I just copy, I don't copy as DNG. Again, in theory, I might want to move. Add is only for pictures that are already where they belong, which generally speaking, for new images that you've just captured, that's not going to be the case. They haven't gotten there yet because we're making use of Lightroom to deal with all of those steps of that initial workflow. So we're copying. Then we have to decide where we're copying to. And in this case, I'm choosing this Photos folder that is pretending to be my big, huge, massive hard drive full of all sorts of pictures. And again, just like with that catalog, my preference is to have a single catalog so that I know where all of my photos are in terms of management. I also prefer to use a single external hard drive to store all of my images. So there's never any question about where my pictures are. Yes, that means I have to replace my hard drives on a somewhat frequent basis because I take way too many pictures. And so I fill those drives up. But at least then I don't have to worry about which drive my photos are on, which catalog they're on, et cetera. And we'll talk about some exceptions to that a little bit later once again. All right, so I've specified just the primary location, not the folder yet, not the folder yet. Uh, we'll address that folder shortly. Let's take a look at the other settings here. Now, in Lightroom, because we're dealing primarily with raw captures, and certainly many wedding photographers will shoot JPEG, 
for a variety of different reasons. But regardless, we're actually using references to our images in Lightroom to work in Lightroom. So you might think of it as we're not really looking at the real picture, we're looking at Lightroom's preview version of the photo. And so at all times, Lightroom is going to generate certain previews for us. Upon import, my recommendation is to always build at least standard and maybe one-to-one. -one. And that, in large part, depends upon your particular style, both for reviewing your images as well as your style as a photographer. Do you have a heavy trigger finger and you capture lots and lots and lots of images, or are you a little bit more selective? So if you tend to zoom in on almost every single picture, you want to make sure it's sharp, you don't take that many pictures anyway, maybe you're really selective, then you might want to generate the one-to-one -one previews at the time of import. It's okay if you don't generate those now, so why would you generate either of these previews to begin with? Well, the standard preview, you can think of as your monitor-sized preview. When you're just browsing the image, maybe even browsing full screen, but you can see the entire image, that's when you're using the standard size preview. If you generate standard size previews upon import, it'll take a little bit of time initially, but that means you're not gonna have to wait as you move from one image to the next for that preview to load. Initially, it might look like the photo's a little bit out of focus, for example, and then it suddenly pops into focus. Hopefully, in the meantime, you haven't been too quick on the delete key. And so those standard previews, I think, are a bare minimum in terms of importing your photos. The one-to-one -one previews will be generated automatically if you zoom in on the photo. If you never zoom in, you never need a one-to-one -one preview. You never need to consume that extra hard drive space. But then if you do need to zoom in, it's gonna take a little bit of extra time. So if you tend to zoom in a lot, then you might wanna use this one-to-one -one option right at import. It'll take a little bit longer for those previews to generate, but now there's less time to wait when you're zooming in. So again, that depends in large part on your personal style. I take a lot of pictures, but I don't tend to zoom in on any but the ones that I've already identified are probably my favorites. And so for me personally, I use that standard option, but good to be aware of the options that are available to you. Build smart previews, to me, that option is only really important if you need to be able to optimize your images in the develop module when the photos are not available. And in my experience, most wedding photographers are not going to be in a situation where the photos are unavailable. Now, if you do a lot of international wedding photography, you get to fly off to foreign countries, take pictures there, and then fly home. Maybe you want to be able to work on the plane when you don't have your hard drive readily available. That type of situation would call for smart previews, but in general, I don't consider them to be critical. You could always build them later if need be. Uh, the suspected duplicates option. Now, this is one of those hypotheticals, because of course I would never run into this problem personally. But hypothetically speaking, let's say that you had taken some pictures on a card, you filled it up about halfway, you download those images, and then you forget to reformat the card, and you take new pictures. Now you go to download the images again after the card gets full, the first half is all duplicates. So hypothetically speaking, if that were to ever happen to me, I would wanna make sure that this do not import suspected duplicates checkbox was turned on. And I just leave it on all the time, even though again, I would never have that type of situation where I may, I don't know how I know so much information about it if I have never done that, but that's not important right now. I have never yet seen a false positive here. Now, it's not just looking at the file name and saying, oh, it's the same file name, it must be the same file. It actually looks at some of the metadata values to determine if the photo is, in fact, a duplicate. I've never seen a false positive. But I still recommend that you scroll through the images to make sure. And if there is an image that's a suspected duplicate, it will be dimmed. Now, here I've just turned off the checkbox for this image at the top right so that we can kind of get a simulation. If it were actually a duplicate, it would be even darker. It would be even darker, and so it gives us a very clear indication that there are some duplicates, you better make sure that it's a legitimate situation because you certainly don't want to miss out on actual photos. So I still recommend scrolling through even though you've got that option turned on and even though in my experience it has behaved remarkably well. Next, we have the paranoia checkbox. Make a backup copy too, make a second copy too. I can turn that checkbox on and then I can click the summary that specifies exactly where I want to back up and I have a little backup location created here, so I can choose that folder, and all of my photos during the import process will be backed up to a second location. The key thing here is to make sure that that second location is a second physical location. 
not just a different folder on the same hard drive, but a completely separate hard drive so that if the drive fails, you have a backup to fall back on. We'll take a look at the backup itself momentarily. Now, renaming is interesting. I often ask when I'm presenting about Lightroom, should you rename your images and why should you rename your images? And I'm actually an advocate for renaming, but mostly because I'm easily annoyed and I don't like the file names that come out of the camera. They're just totally meaningless and I want to have something cooler for my file names. But when it comes to wedding photography, I think the most important reason to rename your photos is that those files are going to be seen by the people who are paying you to take their pictures. So at the very least, shouldn't you put your photography company name as part of the file name? Or at least their name so that they feel you know, that it's personalized, that you actually spent some time working on their images? Or you know, if you like the pandering approach, you could rename the photos to like best clients ever or something like that. However, I'm not going to rename now. I'm not going to rename now, and I'll explain why shortly, uh, but I will rename the photos. We'll talk about that shortly. We do have the option at import. This is normally when I would want to rename, but in the case of wedding photography, it's not when I want to rename, especially if you have two shooters. Uh, apply during import. You guys were here for Mel this morning? Was that this morning or this afternoon? I think it was this morning. It's all a blur now, isn't it? And you talk about shooting only in black and white? I shoot in color. That's okay, but I like pizza, so. But, but for Mel, yeah, he shoots in color. Well, actually, if you're shooting in RAW, of course, it doesn't, there's no such thing as shooting in black and white, right? If you set your camera to black and white, but you're shooting in RAW, the camera just says, whatever. It's still, I mean, I, technically, maybe you could say a, a RAW capture is not really a color picture, per se. You know, there's a little bit of technicality involved there. But the bottom line is, with a RAW capture, it doesn't matter. But my point here is that if you're capturing in RAW or if you're capturing in a color JPEG, you can actually apply presets during the import process so that we can say, for example, show me, you know, we'll maybe go with something a little bit more basic like a low contrast, kind of a contrasty version of black and white. But if you work in the develop module, find a preset that you like. It's sort of an interesting concept, right? Because on the one hand, Every picture I take is unique and deserves special attention. On the other hand, I'm in a hurry and I want to get these pictures processed as quickly as possible. More importantly, in a case like this where we're dealing with a large number of images, if you have a particular look that you like to apply to your photos, yeah, I get it that you're going to want to apply some personalized touches to most if not all of your photos. But in the initial process when you're reviewing, if your style is black and white, if you're going to produce a photo album later or a book that is black and white, doesn't it make sense to at least have a basic black and white interpretation of the photos right from the start? So you have a better sense of what that result might look like. So find a preset that you like in the develop module and you can plug that in here. So again, something that I don't typically do unless it is a situation such as portraiture or wedding photography where I'm going for a particular look and it's just easier for me to be able to sort things on the fly if I've applied that look. Now metadata can be a slightly tricky one as well. I'm just gonna go into edit presets from that metadata pop-up and I'll choose the preset that I've already defined for myself here. And you can see that I've added copyright information so that nobody will ever steal my pictures. And I've added contact information so if somebody sees my pictures on Facebook or Twitter or any of these other websites, except for the part where Facebook takes out all your metadata so nobody knows who took the picture. Thanks a lot, Facebook, for nothing. But I digress. But my, my thought is, my, my fantasy actually, is that somebody will see this information and say, wow, this guy's good. We should give him money. It hasn't happened yet, but you know, things, you know, search engine optimization and whatnot, it takes a while for these things to kick in sometimes. But point being is that I can apply some of this metadata. And the reason I say it might be a little bit tricky is if you've got two shooters. In that situation, you sort of have to decide who owns the pictures. The, the best is when it's like a husband and wife. Or, well, actually, <laughs> I can't think of what would be the best. But the, the point is that if we've got two photographers who are essentially competitors, but they've agreed, hey, when I get a job, I'll hire you as a second shooter, and when you get a job, you hire me as a second shooter, which I've seen plenty of times, and it can work out really great, except now who owns the pictures? 
Well, very easily, when we're importing, we're probably importing from a single camera, and so we can use a preset, one for each of the photographers. So here's my preset that I've defined. I could define another for my second shooter and assign those upon import. Just choose the particular preset upon import so that, that information gets added to the images automatically. Then there's the other wrinkle. Have you ever traded cameras? Second shooter grabs the first shooter's camera. Oh wait, no, I need the one with the long lens. Here, let's swap cameras really quick. Now, I know that now we're starting to get into the minutia of do you really care? At some point you have to just say, look, it's my wedding. I'm gonna own these pictures and you're just my second shooter getting a work for hire fee. But point being is that these things can be a little bit complicated so you might wanna think about it. Or, you know, just marry your second shooter. And then it becomes easier. All right, so I've specified some settings. Here I've already plugged in all of the information that I care about. If I had made changes or if I had not yet defined a preset, then I could come up to the top and click on the preset pop-up and then choose Save Current Settings as New Preset. So I could apply a preset for a second shooter or whatever the case may be. In this case, I'll just leave that as it is. And then keywords. Keywords are very important, right, to being able to find your pictures later. Except which keywords can I assign now? Because just with metadata, we have to be careful. If I'm gonna use a preset for all of my images, you'll notice I'm not putting a star rating in that metadata preset, operating under the assumption that every single picture I import is gonna be a five star rating. I mean, it might be, but I'm not so confident that I'm gonna put that into that preset. So I have to be careful, make sure that whatever values I'm putting into a metadata preset are universal to all the images that I'm going to import, or at least all the images to which I'll apply that preset. Similarly with keywords, well what sort of keywords can I assign at this point? Wedding, you know, maybe the last name of the couple, in theory the date, location. A lot of that information is probably going to be captured in the folder name, for example, that we'll use in just a moment. Um, or it's so generic that it's almost meaningless. If you're a wedding photographer and pretty much all you ever do is photograph weddings, how helpful is that wedding keyword in your photos? It's like every single image is gonna pull up. So certainly we're thinking about, we'll talk about keywords a little bit more shortly. I'll show you some, some techniques that I use for assigning keywords to images. But if you're going to apply keywords during the import process, bear in mind, we're applying the same set of keywords to every single image that's being imported right now. So things like location, you know, spring, summer, fall, that type of stuff, night if it's a night wedding, you know, those sorts of things probably would be appropriate now, but just be thoughtful about that if you're going to assign keywords at this early stage. So earlier I mentioned that I was defining just the primary location where I'm downloading my images to. So for example, just my hard drive. But obviously I don't want every single picture that I ever capture to all be in one location on my hard drive. I need a folder structure to help keep things a little bit more organized. And so I'm gonna turn on this into subfolder checkbox down in the destination section over on the right panel. And then I'll click in to type a name. And normally I would use what? Wedding. <laughs> Again, very generic. So now the question is when you're looking for a wedding, how are you going about looking for that wedding? When the bride or groom calls up and says, yeah, we need to get another photo album or we need to get some more prints made up or can you, you know, give us some more of those pictures? Whatever the case may be, where are my pictures? You wanna be able to find their photos pretty easily. So now the question is, how do you think about your client? How are you going about actually remembering where those photos are? Maybe you use a calendar, and so you just go look up in your calendar and you find the date, and so a date structure works well for you. To me, it's so straightforward. It's just the last name of the bride and groom. All right, so in this case, we're gonna keep it anonymous, and I'm just gonna call this Island Wedding. I also like to include the month and year just as a matter of course, just to help. If you, for example, if you just use last name and the word wedding, Smith wedding, there's a decent chance that sometime in your career you get a couple of people with the same name. Obviously you can add first names, et cetera, but as a matter of course, I just like having the date. What I recommend is to include the year first and then the month. So I'll put a space there as well. So for example, 2014, and this is, uh, what month is this? This is March, so 03. And so that way, if I've got any similarly named folders, I'll end up with a sort order that works based upon multiple dates. All right, so I've got that folder defined. That takes care of everything as far as establishing all of these options. But real quickly, 
for review. Think about all the things that we're doing. I'm copying my photos from my compact flash card to my hard drive. I'm making a backup copy to another hard drive. I might be renaming. I might be assigning keywords. I'm probably adding copyright, contact information, possibly other metadata. I'm organizing all those uh, photos into a single folder. There's a lot that's happening here. And it's pretty straightforward, pretty simple. So I'm gonna go ahead and click the import button. Those images will be copied. You'll notice that Lightroom takes me by default directly to that current import so that I could immediately start reviewing these images if I wanted to. The copy operation is actually already finished. If you take a look up at the top left, you'll see that we get an indication, a status update, letting me know that Lightroom is now building those previews. So I asked for those monitor-sized previews of my images. Lightroom is now generating those for me. And now it's finished. That was so fun, we should do it again. But faster. So let's import one more time. And mostly I want to show you this for two reasons. One, we've got a second camera here. We'll deal with that momentarily. But more importantly, just to point out that there's really not a whole lot that we need to do otherwise. Because these settings are almost all, not all, but almost all sticky. And so let's take a quick look. We're importing from a different card now. We're copying still. We're still going to the photos drive. We're still not Im importing any suspected duplicates, even though that's a moot point and I would never make a silly mistake like that. I'm making a backup copy. If I were renaming, I'm probably using a sequence number. The sequence number does not increment automatically from import to import. So it would still be at number one, for example. I've got to go look at my prior photos, the prior import, see what the last number is, add one to it, and then plug that number in. Minor little issue there, something to be aware of. But notice, again, that metadata, if it's the same shooter, I can leave that as it is. Keywords would be cleared out. So even if I had typed keywords on the first import, they're flushed. Now that might seem like a bummer until you added keywords with the family's last name. Then you go to the next wedding and you go to import those photos and you've assigned that family from the previous wedding's last name as a keyword. To Things can get really, really messy really quickly. So that's actually one of those that you might think initially, boy, I wish that was sticky too so that it would just remember from import to import, <laughs> except It'll remember, and you'll forget to clear it out. So to me, this is the safer of the two approaches. You can see that I still have that same folder structure. So basically, I didn't really have to do anything. I still recommend checking, especially if you've renamed or assigned keywords, take a close look at those, scan to make sure that everything really is the way you left it, and then click Import. Point being is that the first one took a long time to do, right? But that's real, it has nothing to do with it taking a long time. That has to be, that's me not having brevity figured out yet. But in, in reality, as you see from the second import, it works really quickly. It's very, very easy. Just get in there, check your settings, boom, import the next set of images. The only thing that's going to slow you down is copying photos. And that's why you know, I talk a lot about compact flashcards, getting the fastest cards you can, not because you actually need it in the camera, but because you're going to be grateful for it later when you're downloading to your computer. All right, so we've imported into this island wedding folder, and so now we've got both of those import operations. And in this case, I'm gonna sort by file name, and I'm gonna filter. So I'm gonna do a little bit of uh, smoke and mirrors here, just because. I'm gonna select all of the images. So these images were captured with two different cameras. One's a D3 and one's a D3X. We don't have to worry about how I'm filtering or any of this other stuff. All we need to know is that I'm assigning a red color label to the images that were captured with one camera and a yellow color label to the images that were captured with another camera. That doesn't matter for anything. So it, I didn't even need to tell you that I was doing that, except to show you that when we sort by file name, notice that I've got all the yellow photos and then all the red photos. Why is that? Well, it might be that I'm using two different brands of camera, and they use different file naming structures, right? So for example, here we have DSC versus IMG for Canon cameras, all right? We might have a situation where it's the same model of camera even, except the sequencing number. One camera left off at number 2,427, and the other camera was left off at 8,500 and whatever number I'm gonna make up. 
And so when we sort by file name, that file name sort might be somewhat meaningless, at least for our context. One of the things I am so grateful for in Lightroom is the ability to sort images by capture time. That is not available as an actual setting in Adobe Bridge. You can go based on the file name, of, I'm sorry, the file date, but that will not always be accurate depending upon your particular workflow. So now that I sort by capture time, you can see that the images are mixed up a little bit. We've got a burst of images with the red camera, a couple images with the yellow camera, and we're kind of switching back and forth. This is one of the reasons that I did not rename the photos upon import. Because what are the odds that anyone that you send these photos to, probably mostly the bride and groom, but maybe some family members or you know, whatever the case may be, what are the odds that they're going to be using software that will intelligently sort by capture time? What are the odds that they're even using software? They're just using the operating system to pull up that folder full of JPEG images that you sent them, and it's just gonna be sorted alphabetically by file name. So that's number one reason why if you've got more than one shooter, I definitely would not rename during import because the renaming is essentially going to become a little bit meaningless. One camera gets you know, the first batch of numbers, the second camera gets the second batch of numbers, and you know, yes, you could sort by capture for you, the capture time, but for anybody else, those file names are gonna be a little bit weird. Also, how many of you have a tendency to delete photos? How many of you never delete a single photo from any wedding ever? Thank you. Yeah, then I'm not really good about deleting photos anyway. I mean, I, I'm not suggesting that I ever take a bad picture. But just hypothetically, again, I, I just, I don't like the notion of deleting photos. Yeah, of course, I've, I've known other photographers who accidentally took a picture with a lens cap on and that, if I were them, that's the type of picture that I might delete. Uh, but especially when it comes to a wedding, how many, have you ever dealt with a bride who was maybe like, um, how do you say it nicely? Um, a little um, eager to see every single picture. And you try to explain to them, but I, you know, I take, I'm, high-speed, continuous shooting, I've got thousands of, you don't want to have to go through all of them, and they're very insistent. If you're the type of photographer who deletes the outtakes, you don't want to have gaps in your numbering, because then they're going to notice those gaps, and they're going to say, hey, wait a minute, what about the one in between? What was that? I think I might have been smiling better in that other one. So another reason to save that renaming for later, if you're going to delete any of your outtakes, and you don't want anybody to know there ever were any outtakes, uh, or if you're using multiple cameras again. So this is actually the point when I would start renaming if I'm not a deleter. So for me personally, I don't like deleting images, even if you know, they're not that great, it's out of focus. There's always some reason that it might be special to someone for some reason. Really, it's just my own mental issues, but that's beside the point. So I don't like to delete during my review. If you like to delete, if part of your workflow, and I'm gonna talk about how I sort through the images momentarily, but if you delete any of the shots that you think are not worth keeping or sharing with the, the wedding party or what have you, take care of that process first. Go through and delete any outtakes, then we'll rename. So I'm in the grid view, and I'll talk about the different views momentarily. I'm in that grid view. Again, I theoretically could have renamed during import, but I'm gonna save it for a little bit later in my workflow. And so with all of those images selected, sorted in the order that I want them. So again, sorting by capture time, down there on the toolbar below the grid or loop display, well, underneath the grid display. So I'm sorted by capture time. I've done whatever I need with the photos. And so now I'm gonna go onto the library menu and choose rename photos. Now there are all sorts of different options that are available to you. But I'm a man of simplicity. And so I don't use most of those options. You know, you could have like, the lens focal length as part of the file name. Now I can see how that'd be useful for like marketing purposes, reinforcing that you used a very expensive lens to photograph this wedding or something like that. But by and large, I think keeping it simple makes a lot of sense. And so I, for me personally, I tend to use a custom name plus a sequence number. The default preset, the default template here in Lightroom though, uses a one digit number for that sequence number. Now, when you get up to 10, it'll start using two digits, and when you get up to 100, it'll start using three digits, but that means file name sort order won't be in the correct order. And so what I recommend is going into the edit option here, 
and changing that sequence number. You see how it's one digit? Change it to, you know, in, in most cases, I hope for a wedding, four digits is probably fine. That gives you 9,999 pictures for the wedding. Ho Anybody ever go over 10,000 shots for a wedding without doing time lapse? Nobody? Good. <laughs> That's probably a good sign. Uh, but if you wanted to be paranoid, you know, I've got a five digit sequence number here too. So I've created a new preset that's got just custom text plus a sequence number of five digits. Um, so to me, that's a real simple approach. And so we'll, again, I'll just call this island wedding. Now I do like to use underscores instead of spaces, not because I actually need to, but because in some cases when you're posting images online, if you're sharing the images online for people to see, you've seen like in lieu of a space, it'll be percent 20. Which, I mean, obviously, you know, your brain just sort of automatically fixes that, right? Every time you see percent 20, you just think, space? <laughs> yeah, it's very difficult to read. And so even though, by and large, it's completely unnecessary, there's a few situations here and there where that file naming can be a little bit of an issue. And so you'll notice that my preset has a dash between the, the custom name, the text that I'm going to define, plus the sequence number, but then where I would otherwise have a space. So a dash separates different elements and an underscore just replaces the space. So in this case, island underscore wedding, for example. Sequence starting number one. Obviously, I'm renaming all of the images from the entire wedding in theory, so of course I'll start with one. But if you were working in batches for some reason, obviously we could adjust that number. I'll go ahead and click OK, and now all of those images are renamed virtually instantaneously. They are renamed on the hard drive, so we don't have to worry about things getting out of sync on the hard drive versus inside of Lightroom. Uh, but now we've got more meaningful file names. So if we're gonna send these to a client, for example, obviously it'll be a little bit more meaningful for them. Uh, now this introduces a little bit of a challenge and there's a couple of you know, sort of points of frustration, you might say, when it comes to my backup. So here's the backup. Remember when we were importing, we backed up our images while we were working because we were paranoid. We wanna be able to reformat the card. There's a couple of problems with that backup. Number one, the folder structure does not match the folder structure of what I've imported. Rather, it's based on date. So in my mind, I don't think of this as my real backup. This is my initial workflow backup for import purposes only. Once I'm back home and I've had a chance to get settled, then I'll back up my photos drive again. Now I've got duplicate copies of everything. Now this backup that I created just on the fly as part of my image management workflow can be deleted at some point or just retained as yet another backup. The other thing, do that back up quickly, because you'll notice that the photos here are not renamed, of course, because these are just backup copies of the photos that I imported. So Lightroom doesn't really know about them, you might say. It knows about the pictures that it's managing, but these are just extra copies, insurance copies of my photos. And so that backup, again, I think of it as just a temporary, giving me confidence to reformat my card and use it again if I need to type of backup. It doesn't replace my real backup. And for me personally, my preferred backup is an exact copy of my primary drive. So I don't want an incremental backup, for example, that it's just backing up whatever's changed since the last time. I wanna make an, an exact copy, a mirror image, and a second mirror image, put one in a safe deposit box, you know. You can never be too paranoid, I'm told. All right. So then when it comes to you know, organizing, there's, and this is something that I tend to do out of order with a wedding as opposed to other types of photography, and that is keywording. And different photographers have different attitudes about how important keywording is, how much time they want to spend keywording. What I usually find is that Photographers want to spend zero time actually keywording their images, but they want their images to be found very easily by just typing whatever word they're thinking of. Which is to say, you know, they want to put in no effort, but somehow have a magic solution. Um, and so, it, you know, it's, it's a personal decision as far as how much keywording you're going to do for your images and you know, the, the amount of time that you're going to spend. What I recommend is thinking about when you're looking for photos later, Number one, how many photos are you gonna to have to go through? If you're kind of a tight shooter, if you're not shooting countless images at every wedding, then is it really that difficult to find the picture of them walking down the aisle or them cutting the cake or you know, whatever picture it is that you're looking for, for whatever reason? And if you're using other methods to filter those images, if you're already identifying your favorite images, 
then that keywording might not be all that critical. If you shoot a lot, then the keywording might be very critical. And so, you know, at a minimum, you might want to do things such as, you know, identifying which images are portraits and which ones are the ceremony and which ones are the reception, et cetera. And so a few things that I'll point out when it comes to keywording. First off is that I think in most cases with wedding photos, you're going to have sort of sequences of images. You're going to have, you know, the getting ready photos. You're going to have the ceremony photos. You're going to have the reception photos, et cetera, et cetera. And so, and usually those are sequential, more or less, right? And so we can generally work pretty well as far as identifying blocks of images that we want to apply certain keywords to. So we'll just grab a few examples here. You know, we'll call this little segment uh, portraits, for example, just this little sequence of images. But if we're going to apply uh, keywords to multiple images at once, it's very important that we're working in the grid view, not in the loop view. So this is a loop view. And this is the grid view. Loop view meaning you know, we're sort of taking a closer look at the image. Well, if you're taking a look at that image, at one image, deciding if it's sharp or deciding what adjustments you need to apply to it, what have you, Lightroom thinks of it as you are focused on one image. And therefore, if you assign a keyword, you're assigning a keyword to one image. So again, if you're in the loop view, that means that you are assigning a keyword to one image. If you're in the grid view, you can be assigning keywords to multiple images, and that's true even though down on the film strip we can see that multiple images are selected. If we're not in the grid view, we're not working with multiple images. Now, we could synchronize metadata. We can even turn on auto-synchronization for the metadata for our images. I don't like to do that because then I'm going to forget to turn it off and now I'm synchronizing anytime I'm selecting multiple images. So my recommendation is to get in the habit of always selecting multiple images using only the grid view. If you need to select multiple images because you're going to apply some sort of metadata update to multiple images, select those multiple images using the grid view, not the film strip. All right? So once you have those images selected, then we can very easily add keywords. So I'm in the grid view, I have multiple images selected, and Lightroom helpfully says, you see right down here, click here to add keywords. So I'll click here to add keywords. So what keyword might I add? Well, we'll call these, you know, portraits, for example, family, you know, whatever the case may be. In some cases, maybe you want to take the time to identify individual people. Again, it just depends on how much time you want to focus on keywording your images versus getting other things done. But also, we have keyword sets. Now, it's interesting, Lightroom includes a wedding photography keyword set right out of the box. And that's handy. There's nine available slots for these keyword sets. So, of course, you've got bride and groom, candid, wedding party, family, black and white, which in my experience, you're kind of one or the other, right? Either you're a black and white photographer or you're a color photographer, so you don't usually need to assign a keyword for that pre-ceremony, ceremony reception. So this gives you a pretty good sense, but we can apply changes there. So I'm gonna click on that pop-up once again and go to edit set. And here's the values that Lightroom gave us that they thought would be most helpful to you as a wedding photographer, but you can change these. So for example, instead of candid, maybe we would say portrait, seeing as how that's a keyword that I was already using. Uh, let's say that you know, black and white is not one that I would use at all and what else might we do? You know, uh, preparation, for example. Oops. I have to spell it right because it's on TV. All right, and then once I've defined those updated values, then I could either replace the existing or if I want to create a new preset. So I could update my wedding photography keyword set or I can make my own. I'll go ahead and make my own here. Tim's wedding keywords and click Create. And that way, go ahead and click that, we can choose Tim's wedding keywords over here from the keyword set, and those are available. And so now, I'll go ahead and scroll down and we'll, find, we'll just call all of these reception. All I have to do is go and click on the particular word here that I want to assign to the selected images. So I have some reception photos selected. I'll go ahead and click reception. You can notice up above here that reception has been added as a keyword. But also, in that keyword set, we've got reception 
highlighted, you might say. So reception appears white, all the other keywords appear in gray. So it gives us a visual indication of which of those keywords have been assigned versus are available at the click of a button. And so I find that that can be a little bit helpful for some of those more important keywords. And I think for photographers who maybe feel like they don't want to spend much time assigning keywords to their images, that's a great way to actually make use of keywords because you're limiting yourself to just the broad categories of photos that you might capture at a wedding and they're just a click away. So just select images, multiple images in the grid view, click on one of those keywords in the keyword set section and you're good to go. But again, you can select individual images at any time as well and add keywords along the way. So keywording to me, you know, it tends to be one of those things where you're spending a reasonable amount of time and you're not really necessarily sure, you know, if, if it's going to be helpful to you later or you like me, you're just lazy. And so I tend to take an approach where I'm identifying just my favorites versus not so favorite images. And you might say that there are three basic options that Lightroom gives you on that front. Uh, one would be pick flags, the other would be star ratings, and then we have color labels. And I have some opinions, of course. So when it comes to pick flags, I have two problems with pick flags. Number one is that it requires making a yes or no decision. Not my strong suit. So I got a lot of like maybes, right? And so I like to be able to stack rank my images. Plus, let's bear in mind too that when we're sharing the photos later, if you're producing an album, there's going to be like the real, you know, the cover photo, but there's also going to be sort of those supplemental images. So just because it's not one of your favorites from the wedding doesn't mean you're not going to use it in some context later. And so I tend to prefer to use star ratings where I can kind of give a relative rank to the images that I consider my favorites. But the other reason that I don't like using pick flags is that pick flag is a Lightroom only construct, meaning that that information is only written to the Lightroom catalog. I don't like that. I like being able to have all my metadata written out to the files themselves. In the case of raw captures, that would be an XMP sidecar file. If we're talking about DNG, TIFF, or JPEG, that would go inside the file itself. And Lightroom, by default, only puts your information, your metadata updates, into the catalog. It doesn't write them out to the photos. So if you lost your Lightroom catalog, you're going to have a bit of a problem on your hands if you haven't backed it up recently. And so we'll take a quick aside here. I'm going to go up to the Lightroom menu on Macintosh. That would be the Edit menu on Windows. And we'll choose Catalog Settings. And I'm going to go to the Metadata tab here. And there are two options that I want to take a look at. The first is automatically write changes into XMP. What this really means is write metadata from Lightroom out to the photos themselves, but don't worry, if they're raw captures, it will be written out to an XMP sidecar file instead of risking the possibility of corrupting your original raw captures. But apparently the people at Adobe thought that was a little too long-winded, and so they made it say this instead. So I'm going to turn that checkbox on. Why would you have that checkbox turned off other than the fact that it's the default setting? Well, conceptually, if you're, for example, writing keywords to 10,000 images all at once, with this option turned on, instead of just making some updates to the catalog, Lightroom has to actually update 10,000 individual XMP sidecar files. And that can take a little bit of time, and it's going to use up some resources on your computer to slow down overall system performance. So if system performance is your absolute biggest priority, then you might want to leave that option turned off. For me, I prefer, number one, to have that sort of built-in backup, that my information is being written out to the photos along the way. And I like knowing that if I browse my images real quickly with Bridge, for example, I'll still see all those metadata updates. But as I mentioned, pick flags are not written to XMP. So even with this option turned on, if you're using pick flags as your primary method for giving a thumbs up or a thumbs down, to your images, you're not backing them up, you're not going to see them in other applications, et cetera. So that's the main reason that I don't like using pick flags. Um, I'll also mention just real quickly, if you do cross time zones to capture images, we have the option down below, do you want to write date or time changes out to the actual raw capture? That will actually touch the original raw capture. Much is made about Lightroom being non-destructive. It's one of the things that I appreciate most about Lightroom is that it's always working non-destructively. It's not harming your original photo, your original captures. But you do have the option if you need to update the capture date and time. So if you cross time zones, if you ever forget to change date and time on your camera, something to co contemplate. 
Uh, personally, I'd rather have the file updated, so I like to have that turned on. But bear in mind, there is a risk. There is the potential that Lightroom is going to scramble your raw captures. Um, I've never heard of a case where that's happened, but something to be aware of in any event. So I'd certainly make sure you had a backup of your photos first. All right, so now I know that all of the updates are going to be written to XMP as long as I'm using star ratings or color labels. So let's touch on color, color labels real quick. The issue with color labels is that they don't have any real meaning. Historically, they were used to identify priority. So red is most important, yellow is second most important, purple you'll get around to never. And so you've got that sort of relative order. But maybe that might be a little bit of a stretch. I know a lot of photographers will make their own custom meaning for those color labels. You know, red means it needs to be printed, yellow means it needs to be retouched, or whatever the case may be. Except you can only assign one color label to an image. And so that starts to become a little challenging. So they're, they're a little bit challenging in that respect. They don't seem to have an inherent meaning, I would suggest. And since you can only assign one, you're a little bit limited in terms of how you actually approach them. So for me, star ratings just make perfect sense. And even if you don't like the idea of having five different stars to choose from, I would recommend that because of this issue of not being able to write out the pick flag status to an XMP sidecar file, you might want to use star ratings in any event. So the approach that I recommend, and I, I actually work pretty fast when I'm doing this. I'm big on using the keyboard. I'll show you a couple of variations here that you can use when you're actually going through and sorting through your photos. First off, of course, we're going to be working in the loop view. So we can switch between the loop view and the grid view using the buttons on the toolbar here down the bottom left. So I've got the grid view display or the loop view display. I like to use keyboard shortcuts for that. And so G for grid view, E for loop view, which is how I remember to spell loop with an E on the end. So E for loop view, G for grid view. So I'll go back to my first image. Generally speaking, make sure that I'm sorted based on capture time. And then I will scroll through those images. And the basic idea here is I want to try and do at least two passes if at all possible, I know. They're waiting eagerly for their photos. You're feeling the pressure to get them the pictures because that next weekend is fast approaching and they're gonna be back from their honeymoon any day now. But I still like to try and take two passes if at all possible, in large part just to sort of get a better chance to review the images more than once and also to sort of separate out the emotion to some extent. In other words, you know, kind of pull back a little, hopefully review once, wait a day, come back and review again if you have that kind of time on your hands, which I hope you do. Well, not really. I hope you're so busy photographing more weddings that you never have time for this. But then you just get an intern or something. <laughs> All right, so I use the approach where I only assign one star on my first pass. One star. Because to me, one star doesn't mean bad. One star means acceptable. Not going to delete it. Keeper. Probably could use it. May or may not be my best work but one star. Because to me, if, if one star means it's a bad picture, why are you even wasting the calories to assign a one star rating in the first place? Just leave it alone. And I review every photo. And so I know that the pictures that I didn't think were quite going to make the cut, they don't have any stars assigned to them. And I tend to keep everything. So my first pass, only one star. It's I'm making a yes or no decision right now. I'm just being really like loose about it. Like I'm, I'm going to cut myself a little bit of slack. So say, oh yes, of course, he's looking, waiting for his bride to arrive, so that's gotta be a one star, and that's a one star. Hmm, maybe, no, I like that one better. So I can kind of bounce back and forth. So I'm just using keyboard shortcuts here. The number one on the keyboard to assign a one star rating, and then the arrow key to move, you know, right arrow to move to the next image, left arrow to move to the previous image if I need to move back and forth just a little bit. And so I'll navigate through those photos and just use the keyboard shortcuts to assign star ratings as I see fit. But again, only one star on that first pass. And I'll go through every single picture and assign either one star or move on to the next picture. Now, a couple of options that are available to you if you want to try and speed up this process a little bit. I tend to use two hands for whatever reason, and so I'm going to assign a star rating and then use my arrow key to navigate to the next image, for example. But if you'd like, you can hold the shift key. And when you assign a star rating, so we'll say this image gets a one star rating, for example. If I hold the shift key and press the number one, the one star rating gets assigned and it moves automatically to the next image. The slight drawback in my mind here is that if I decide that I want to skip this image, now I either need to use the right arrow button or I need to shift zero for zero stars, and that's way on the other side of the keyboard. So to me, that's a little bit awkward. But you can also turn on caps lock. 
which is like telling the computer to hold the shift key down for you. And then we can just say one star and move on. Oh, there's caps lock. One star to move on automatically. Definitely a one star image. Maybe not. Yes, no, no, yes, etc. And it's automatically moving. Now, if you love this behavior so much that you want to always automatically move to the next image, you can go to the photo menu and turn on auto advance. So personally, I like to use two hands, one star, next image, etc. go back and forth. But if you prefer to auto advance, you do have that option. So photo auto advance on the menu or hold the shift key temporarily or turn on caps lock automatically for you know, short periods of time so that you can assign those keywords, assign those star ratings or same thing works with pick flags or color labels if you're so inclined, taking advantage of that auto advance feature. Yes, sir. Yes, your I've got a question for you, Tim. Yes, sir. Okay, this is from John Cohn, Cohn HD. In Lightroom, would you convert all images to DMG or not, and why? I would not. So we talked about that briefly. Uh, as I mentioned, DMG, it allows you to have smaller file sizes. It allows you to bypass the need for an XMP sidecar file. So you've got a raw capture plus an XMP sidecar file. You never see the, the XMP sidecar file in Lightroom, so I don't really care about the fact that it's there. Um, you do get about, on average, a 20% file size reduction with DNG as compared to raw file formats. That varies depending on your particular raw file format, et cetera. But generally speaking, you can count on about a 20% file size reduction. Uh, but to me, I'm never going to feel comfortable, and this is my own personal psychological problems in large part, I'm never going to feel comfortable deleting my original raw captures. And so the notion of converting to DNG to me, that's just creating yet another file that I don't necessarily need because I'm gonna keep my original raw captures as well. Obviously, if you've got a camera that'll shoot DNG, there's a good argument in favor. I would certainly take advantage of it if it was available in camera, but as far as converting after the fact, for me personally, not. There are some advantages, I just have a different preference. Another one? Yep. So this is a pretty good one for wedding photographers. This is from Kerry Budd, Scoopback B. <laughs> Trying to say a Twitter handle sometimes <laughs> doesn't quite Could work little, out. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so from Gary Bud, uh, can you apply a preset of your watermark on while importing? No. So great question, actually. Uh, and I suppose so. Lightroom gives us the ability to define a watermark. I talked about putting our metadata, contact information, and copyright information into metadata so that no one will ever steal our pictures. Um, some people feel that that's not quite enough, with good reason. And so if you're gonna share your pictures, not a bad idea for two reasons, both to on some level discourage people from stealing your images, but I think more importantly to encourage people to know about you as a photographer. In other words, use it as a little bit of marketing, put your website address as a, a sort of a subtle watermark on the images. Lightroom allows you to define those and very easily apply them to your images, but you would apply them at the time of sharing. So when you're exporting images, for example, if you're gonna email them to someone, uh, if you're going to post images to Facebook, if you're going to print images, any time that you are sharing images from Lightroom, you're able to very, very easily apply that watermark in that process. So it works out really easily. Uh, you know, applying the watermark on import, uh, in essence, I guess you could say it, it really wouldn't be doing anything because we're dealing with our raw captures. It would just maybe be marking it as, oh, this person, this picture, we would like to have a watermark applied later. Um, but yeah, the facility is available when you're actually sending your images out of Lightroom for some other purpose to share them wherever that may be. All right. So we've got you know, those several options for that auto advance that allow us to move potentially a little more quickly. Again, a lot of this just comes down to your own personal preference. For me personally, I find it's a lot faster. I've got one finger over on the number one key, a couple fingers on the left and right arrow keys respectively, and now I can just move through the images really, really quickly and decide which ones I wanna mark with a one star rating versus not. Now, at some point, hopefully I'm gonna get a chance to kinda of, you know, decompress a little bit, step away, shoot another wedding, do something else so that I'm not you know, kind of tied up with whatever it was that I was shooting, you know, the, the particular experience photographing that wedding. And so then, at some point later, I'm gonna wanna go through and take a second pass at those images. And generally speaking, what I'll do here, I've already gone through and said yes or no to the images. Either it gets a one star rating or it still has a zero star rating. In other words, it doesn't have a rating at all. Now I'm gonna go through and upgrade some of those one star images. But I don't wanna to have to go through every single picture all over again and keep track of which ones had a rating and which ones don't. And so I'll just use a basic filter. 
And so down on the film strip, down at the bottom right on the film strip, so it's at the top right corner of the film strip, but the film strip is down at the bottom, we've got that little toggle switch, that little power switch. I can flip that switch on and then specify my criteria. I can filter based on pick flags, I can filter based on star ratings or color labels. Well, this is easy because I'm only using star ratings to, to decide yes or no for my images. So I'll just click on the first star there and you can see that the option is set to greater than or equal to. So I have very quickly assigned a filter to all of the images in this folder so that I can only see those that have a one star rating assigned to them. So now I can go through and perform that second pass and try to decide, okay, does this one need to be upgraded? You know, which ones are really my favorite images? Like this one I really like, so maybe I'll upgrade that to a two star or even a three star rating. My personal preference is to save four and five star ratings for later in my workflow, after I've optimized the images, maybe after I've made a couple of test prints, or after I've shared them with the bride and groom to see what they think, you know, whatever the case may be, try and get some time to really live with the images a little bit, optimize the images a little bit, apply whatever corrections, adjustments, et cetera. Um, so I, I take that two-step approach, first time, one star or nothing, and that's basically my yes or no decision, and then taking that second pass on the one stars and upgrading them to two or three, and later, there's gonna be those photos where after, you, know, you make a print or you apply some adjustments or whatever the case may be, and you say, oh, this one's really good. Not only is this one of the best images from this wedding, but this is one of my favorite wedding photos ever, so I want it to have a four or five star rating because later, I can go to all photographs and I can browse every single picture that I've ever taken and filter them based on those star ratings. And so I can say, just, look, Lightroom, and another argument in favor of using a single catalog for all your pictures, by the way. Lightroom, show me all of my five-star pictures with the keyword of wedding that I've ever taken in my entire life because I need to put together a portfolio so that B&H will hire me to come teach other photographers how to take wedding pictures, whatever the case may be. So there's all sorts of benefits to working with that single catalog and then to taking a little bit more of a thoughtful approach to those star ratings and sort of thinking bigger picture, no pun intended, about how you're actually going to need to find your photos later, sort through your photos, et cetera. All right, let's take a look at a couple of other views that I like to use. I'm gonna show you, we'll go to some different images here. Just turn off the filtering. And a couple of different views that are available that are sometimes helpful if you ever have a situation where you're having a hard time making a decision about a particular image or you know, which out of a set of images you want to put to use or that you think is the best out of the three. So let's just take a look at a sequence of images. We'll grab this set of four images of the bride here. So I've selected all four images and I'll go ahead and just use the loop view. Now conceptually what we would normally be doing here is saying, okay, which one's best? Um, I don't know. Wait, which one? Oh wait, hold on, was that? No, you, know, you, kinda, you find yourself going back and forth ever? Or is it just me? And you can't remember, wait, what was the first one again? Hold on. And so I like to take the approach, they call it the compare view. Uh, to me, this is the eye doctor view. So let's take a look at the eye doctor view here, uh, right there and I'm gonna hide my left and right panels with the tab key just so that we can see the images a little more clearly here. So this is my uh, optometrist view. Anybody ever get your eyes checked? And what do they say? Yeah, right or left, before or after? This one, they, they use synonyms because they don't want you to get bored. And so it's like, you know, before or after? Which one's better, which one's sharper? If you have perfect vision, I'm sorry that you don't understand this analogy and I'm bitter. Yeah, so this one or this one? Is this one sharper or is that one sharper? Before or after? It's the same thing. At any given moment, in this case, we're comparing four images. We're trying to get a closer look at four images. We've got four images of the bride. We need to decide which one we like the most. Which one is it gonna be? Well, at any given time, I only have to compare two. I just have to make a decision. Is the one on the left better or the one on the right better? Very simple. And the image on the left is referred to as the select image. It's our current favorite. Well, right now, that's sort of an ambiguous term, right? Because we've just picked four images that are similar and we're trying to sort through them. So select versus candidate. The image on the right is the candidate. The image on the left is select. Really what this boils down to is the last image remaining on the left is going to be our selected image. 
So let's say, for example, that these images, we like them all, and they've all got a one-star rating. Now we need to upgrade only one of them to a two-star rating. Or maybe we're going to remove the star rating from the other three. Whatever approach you're taking, I only have to compare two at a time, but ultimately I'll be left with just one image. And that will be the one that I, for example, upgrade to a higher star rating. So we've got the select image on the left, the candidate on the right. Which one are we going to decide that we like better? Well, I'd probably go with the tighter image over on the right. And so we've got a couple of options. We can flip the select and candidate. We can swap the two. This, to me, doesn't, it just confuses me. Now the image is switched, and I don't really know why. I just switched their position. Because really what I'm trying to decide is, is the image on the right better than or not as good as the image on the left? And so in most cases, if the image on the right is better, then I'll choose to promote the candidate to the select. If it's not better, then I'll just move on. All right, so let's take a look at that in practice. We decide the image on the right is maybe better than the image on the left, just because it's a, a tighter shot. So I'll go ahead and click the button to promote that image. So the candidate becomes the select, and the next image in the sequence becomes the new candidate. So again, I'm only comparing two images at a time. Well, on balance, I think I like the image on the left a little bit better. Sure, the image on the right's a little tighter, but I like having a little bit of the bouquet in the shot. And so I'm not going to promote, to promote this candidate to the select. Instead, I'll just move on to the next candidate. Would I use stars? Not really. This would be a, yeah, this would be a process of deciding which one's going to get the higher star rating or which one's getting a star at all. So here, you know, to me, this, the bouquet here is just like barely in the frame. It's cut off a little bit too much, so not enough flowers. And so I would say no to that one. Except now I click the right arrow and I don't go any further. I've run out. I've hit the end. Well, I can come back. If you take a look at the film strip, you'll notice that we have uh, two little diamond icons. Might be a little difficult to see up there, but we've got the empty diamond, the one that's just an outline, and that marks our current select. And then we've got the one that's filled in that indicates our current candidate. So as we go left and right through the various candidates, you'll notice that that little diamond icon moves as well. So at any time, you can look down on the film strip and see exactly where you are in the process. How many more images do I have to compare? Why isn't it advancing to the next one? Oh, I'm already at the last one. Let's go back through. And so now I might go back and forth a couple of times and just kind of reconfirm. I've made my new selection, what is in theory my final selection, but let's just go through all of them and just compare one at a time and say, yep, I'm done. So at some point, I'm just finished. I've compared, in this case, four images, two at a time, just compare. Left or right, left or right, left or right, and move through the images. When I'm finished, I can just click the Done button and take a look at what happens now. We've got this image as our selected image, and so now we can assign whatever it was. Let's say in this case it was going to be a two-star rating, so I can just press the number two on the keyboard. So the ability to go through multiple images that are similar and make an evaluation. So that compare view is something that I'll typically use when I have similar images. They don't have to be identical. You can see here the framing was a little bit different, tighter versus looser. They don't have to be identical framing, but generally it's something that's pretty close, all right? But then we've got different situations where, for example, we might be comparing just a series of favorite images and we're trying to decide which one we're gonna use for the cover of a book or which one we're gonna use for our promotional brochure or for our website or on Facebook or whatever it might be. So this is a situation where I've got a sequence of images that I like and I'm just trying to uh, choose a single image among many that are not necessarily similar. So that compare view I'm going to use for similar images. When I've got a situation where it's a little bit more disparate, maybe it's images from multiple weddings, or it might be, you know, instead of just portraits, it's all sorts of different images, that's when I might use the survey view. So I'll click that survey view button. That's the fourth button of the sequence there on the toolbar below the image preview area. And I'm gonna press shift tab to get rid of all of my panels. And then I'm gonna press the letter T on the keyboard to get rid of my toolbar. And now I'm using survey view. I'm looking at all of the images all at once. 
This I do not recommend when we're looking at similar images because now you're not able to get a close enough look really to make a determination. Which one do I like better than the other? So that compare is for similar images looking at just two at a time. Survey view is usually disparate images and you're looking at all of them at once. So this can get overwhelming if we're talking about a large number of images. So then we can go through and decide, you know, which one do we not care for? You know, oh, the, the ring on the finger, it's a little too cliche, so maybe I'm gonna exclude this one. And this survey view is a process of elimination. It's like getting voted off the island. And so now I have to choose, okay, who's first to go? Maybe this one, it's a little too cliche, rings. Then the images reshuffle so that they're making as good a use as possible of the available space. Uh, you know, the, uh, what was the name of that TV show? Baywatch, yes, it's a long time ago, I couldn't remember. So we got like the Baywatch thing going here with the lifeguard truck on the beach, maybe we feel like that's a little too cliche. And this one just, you know, isn't quite catching my eye. And the girl's cute, but we really need to focus on bride and groom in this case. And, you know, it said, oh, this puddle is annoying me. Uh, you know, you start making all sorts of decisions. Here's another one, it's the girl, not the bride and groom, and we've decided we want the bride and groom. Point being, say we want both of them, not just one of them, et cetera, et cetera. Each time I make a decision about which one's getting voted off the island next, I just click on the little X and that image disappears. So again, disparate images. I don't need to look really close at each one. I don't need to compare two images at a time side by side. I'm familiar with the images. I just want to go through and try and pick and choose which one is going to be my best. All right, which one's gonna, I don't know. <laughs> well, take a vote. Who's, which one gets deleted next? Removed next? Bottom left, gone. Next? Center? So who knows the name of that structure in the back? Anybody know the name of that rock? That's too bad, because there's a free prize on the line. It's a big rock. Big rock by the water. It's Moro Rock. It's in California, though. It's West Coast. I wouldn't expect you guys to. Moro Rock. Oh, that, oh, that one, yes. Yeah, yeah. Absolutely. All right, so then we're left with just one image in that survey view. So presumably, at this point, I would assign it a special star rating or maybe export it or, you know, whatever it was that I was trying to do with this particular image. At this point, I've narrowed the field down from, how many images was that? Uh, 13 photos down to just one photo. Again, because we're not comparing just two at a time, we're not looking all that closely at the images as we're reviewing them, this survey view is better for situations where you're already familiar with the images, you're just trying to make a decision about those images. All right. So then we've got to get, you know, take things a little bit of a step further, and that's where albums, collections, uh, this ability to sort of bring images together in unique ways. And so let's go ahead and we'll switch to, uh, we'll go to this one. And we're gonna make you know, a photo book, or we're gonna share the images with the client, or we're gonna do whatever that project might look like, whatever that end result is. Sometimes maybe all you have to do is take the one star or greater images and export them all as JPEGs and send them off to the client. Other times maybe you're printing them or sending them off to be printed or making a photo book or what have you. But the point is that you may have situations where you need to organize images based on particular projects. And that's where collections can really be very, very helpful. Um, a couple of things, you know, with collections, we talked about this notion of using a single catalog versus possibly a catalog per wedding. And as much as there are arguments in favor of using one catalog for each of your weddings, I think there are greater benefits to using a single catalog for everything, as, and we talked about a few of those. But one area where things start to get a little bit tricky is if you're using collections. So for example, if you're shooting you know, a couple dozen weddings a year, and you're producing an album for each of those weddings, and you've got a folder for each of those weddings, and now you've got an album collection for each of those weddings, things start to get pretty busy over on the left panel in Lightroom very quickly. So one of the things that we can do is to create a collection set. So I'm gonna go down to the collection section on the left panel in the library module, and I'll click this little plus icon, and then choose Create Collection Set. And we're gonna call this Island Wedding, just because that's what I called the uh, folder. And so 
I've created that collection set. That's a box that I can put a bunch of folders in, if we want to use an analogy. And this is going to help me keep things tidy over on the left panel, as we'll see in just a moment. So let's just invent a couple of projects that we're going to make for ourselves. Let's assume that we've got to make a photo book. Maybe we're going to send some photos off to Blurb, or maybe we're going to use some other service to create a book that is actually going to be printed. And we also need to print a handful of favorite images, you know, one for the bride and groom, and maybe each of the parents, et cetera. So for each of those projects, I want a separate collection. But I don't want a whole string of collections. I want to be able to tidy things up over on the left panel. So I've created a collection set to get things started. And now I'm going to create a collection. So click the plus, choose Create Collection. And we'll just call this uh, Photo Album, for lack of a more creative word. And we're going to put this inside a collection set. So I'll turn on the checkbox for Inside a Collection Set. And I'm going to choose Island Wedding, of course, the collection set that I just created. And now you'll see that that photo album collection, I didn't even have to call it the Island Wedding collection for the photo album because it's inside a collection set. And I can collapse that collection set at any time to help keep that left panel a little more tidy. But here's where things, I think, really get interesting. Conceptually, what we can do is add photos to an album just by dragging and dropping. Maybe I'm just getting old. My talent with the mouse seems to be going downhill over the years, and I, I feel more and more comfortable using the keyboard. And there's actually a super easy way that we can add images to a collection that I find a lot of photographers are not familiar with. So I'm going to go back to the folder that contains the images. You might be familiar with the Quick Collection in Lightroom. The Quick Collection. There is only one Quick Collection. It's called Quick Collection. And the only thing that really makes it special, except having the name Quick Collection, is that it has a keyboard shortcut assigned to it. So you can press the letter B on the keyboard and add an image to the Quick Collection. But I don't want to add an image to the Quick Collection. I'm working on a photo album. I want to, I want to easily add a photo to my photo album collection. So I'm going to right click on my photo album collection and choose set as target collection. Because the letter B is not really a shortcut for the quick collection in Lightroom. It's actually a shortcut for the current target collection. It's just that the quick collection is the default target collection. And it's not immediately obvious that you can make a different collection the target collection. So I'll right click on my photo album collection choose Set as Target Collection. Notice it gets a little plus next to it, so that I know that's the target. And now, anytime I see an image that I want to add to my photo album collection, I can just press the letter B. The keyboard shortcut that we used to think was the Quick Collection keyboard shortcut. It's actually the Target Collection keyboard shortcut. So letter B, and that image is added to photo album. And then maybe this one, and et cetera. You get the idea. We can go through and just image by image decide which photos are going to be added to that particular collection, the new collection that we had created. So we'll go through, and very quickly. Now you're familiar with these photos at this point. I mean, you can go through pretty darn quickly using those arrow keys and the letter B on the keyboard. I'll go ahead and select that photo album, and I'll switch to the grid view just so you can see a little bit clearer indication. So here are the images that we have thus far added to that project. Well, don't forget, we also wanted to create a project for printing some images. And so I'll go ahead and choose that Create Collection option once again. And I'll just call this Prints. And we'll put that inside a collection set, once again, that island wedding. So I click Create. Go to Prints. There's no images in it, of course, because we've just created this collection. I want this to be my target collection. So I could right click and set that as the target collection. I'll go back. Maybe I would go back to the photo album, actually, because presumably, if it's the, you know, among my favorite images that I want to include in the photo album, it's also a candidate for a print. So I could go back there. I can go back to all the images. I can filter, et cetera. And so then I can pick and choose. So let's say, you know, this one I think I might want to make a print of, and this one, et cetera. So I can press the letter B. But again, you can also drag and drop. So just to illustrate that capability, I can drag this image and put it over into the Prince collection as well. 
So if you like drag and drop, you can select multiple images, drag multiple images at a time if you want to. That's certainly an option. I personally prefer to use that keyboard shortcut, setting one of my working collections as the target collection. Uh, I do recommend when you're finished with a particular project that you go back to Quick Collection and right click and set target collection so that Quick Collection is still letter B. So that a month from now, when you're working on some other project and you hit the letter B, you actually, if you didn't realize it was set to Quick Collection, you'll be able to go to Quick Collection and find that photo as opposed to hoping that you can find, you know, which collection's got the little plus next to it. Um, but once again, looking down below here in collections, I've created individual project collections, but then I can collapse those individual collections. And bear in mind also, you know, in this case, I've created a photo album collection. I could also save a photo book project, for example, and that becomes a type of collection. I could save a slideshow. I could save a web gallery. I've got all sorts of capabilities as far as going through and being able to identify projects or identifying you know, special situations um, where I'm sharing images in different ways. Of course, post them all to Facebook, right? All right, one last thing I want to go through, and then I'll, I'll uh, go ahead and open up for a few questions, um, and that is filtering. I'm actually going to go up here to all photographs so that we can see everything that's in this current catalog. We talked earlier about the film strip filter. So down on the film strip, down toward the bottom right of the Lightroom interface, I can very quickly filter images based on pick flag status, star ratings, or color labels. I also have some presets here. We won't worry about those at the moment. I'm going to turn off that filtering. If we're in the grid view, we actually will have access to the library filter up above. We can get to the library filter if we're in the library module by going to the view menu and choosing show filter bar. Or let's assume, for example, we were in the loop view where we're not able to see that library filter. We can also press the backslash key on the keyboard to gain access to not just the library filter, but also the grid view because we can only filter our images with the library filter if we're in the grid view. Again, getting back to that concept of working with one image versus working with many images. And so I'm going to start off with the text option here. Um, if we're searching for keywords, for example, in this case we've assigned uh, very little, few keywords. Uh, what are we? We did some portraits, I think, for example. Um, so I can type portrait. You'll notice that I have this option set to any searchable field. So let's look for 100. Yes. 100 what? Anything. Could be 100 ISO, 100th of a second shutter speed, 100 millimeter lens. I mean, there's all sorts of possibilities. So in many cases, you might want to restrict your search results to a particular thing. So a client calls and says, I love image number 22. Then you can say, OK, I'm going to search the file name for 0022. Probably the person who took that was taking the picture of themselves being taken of a pic, well, anyway. So we can search just by file name, for example, or we can search just by keywords. And so we had, you know, for example, portrait was one of our keywords, and I'm sure if I thought about it for a minute, I could remember other keywords I assigned earlier tonight. <laughs> All right, but the point is that we get some basic text searching. This doesn't allow you to search for every single possible metadata field in all of Lightroom. Think of it as just the most popular. But by and large, I think you'll find that the information that you need to search for will be searchable. We can also use attributes. And this, with one exception, is exactly what we've already seen down on the film strip. We can filter based on pick flags, star ratings, and color labels, but also master images versus virtual copies versus video clips. So how many of you are already capturing video clips as part of your wedding photography, or you've got somebody capturing clips? So it's a great way to filter the videos versus the stills, for example. But otherwise, these options are the same as what we've already seen on that film strip filter. But the one I really love is the metadata option. I used this real quickly without really talking about it when I was filtering by camera. And this, to me, is just huge. Because we can filter based on date. We can filter based on camera. So here's you know, a Canon Mark II, 5D Mark II. Here's a Nikon D3. Here's an unknown camera, et cetera. Um, or I can say all cameras. Lenses. So all sorts of different lenses that were used to capture these images. Which aperture? 
I'm looking for that super narrow depth of field shot at f1.2, or I'm looking for the starburst that was captured at f22. I know some of this stuff is like totally random and it seems a little bit silly until you're looking for a particular photo. You know, if you're on the fly and you need a slower shutter speed because you're going to get this blur of them, you know, whisking out of the, the church or what have you. Well, how are you going to go about getting a slower shutter speed to get that motion blur? If you're shooting aperture priority, you're probably just going to dial down the aperture. You're going to close down the aperture a little bit. Maybe go down to f16. So if you're looking for that blur shot, maybe just looking for anything between you know, f16 and f22, which in this case doesn't apply. Narrow depth of field. So there's an f1.4. Well, what if I don't remember exactly what the aperture was. I just know it's one of my shots with really narrow depth of field. I can select multiple of these items. So I can say f1.4 and 1.8. I'm holding the shift key in this case to get contiguous ranges. I can mix and match. Uh, I only want um, even numbered apertures that don't end in a zero. I don't know. Whatever, you know, silly criteria you want to come up with. So I can click and then shift click to get a range, but then I can also use the control key on Windows or the command key on Macintosh to exclude little segments in between. That is usually really helpful with the dates and that type of thing. But we could do the same thing here. P pick and choose lenses. Camera serial number. Got a second shooter. You know, both of you are shooting with the same model of camera. No problem. We can just set that to camera serial number and filter based on that. So all sorts of options. I can come up with a million ridiculous, absurd examples that you're going to laugh at and you're going to think you're never going to use. I am telling you, get familiar with the options that are here. It will help you find a photo at some point in the very near future. Um, so take a look at all. We can change all of these columns. And so just quickly, you know, we've got camera and lens and focal length, shutter speed, aperture, the ISO setting, whether the flash fired or not. So a variety of different options that can be helpful there. And then we can filter within each of those columns. Oh, you need more than four columns? No problem. Over here at the top right, we can click at the top right of the last column and choose to add a column. Because, you know, we also need to, you know, aspect ratio, whether it's portrait or landscape, a horizontal or vertical. So lots and lots of criteria. You know, when you're looking for a picture to use on the cover of a magazine, you got to go find your verticals, your portraits. So let's see, you know, all pictures. I'll go ahead and set all these to all, but only show me the portraits, those that have an aspect ratio that would be vertical. So a lot of options that are available as far as filtering those images. It's amazing how often I can use this. I, maybe it's just me. It's possible. But I cannot, like, I couldn't remember a name to save my life which is really bad if you're photographing a wedding. Um, and you know, sometimes I forget what day of the week it is, and I forget where I am, what city I'm in. But more often than not, I can remember at least some details. You know, I know the shot I'm looking for. I know that it was shot you know, at night, or I know that the flash fired, or I know that it was with a long lens, or I know that I stopped the lens way down. You know, whatever the case may be, I can come up with some little tidbits. And it's amazing how helpful that can be as far as filtering those images down. Well, thank you guys so much. You've been great. Ladies and gentlemen, Tim Gray. Thank you. Awesome. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it.